Hello and uh, welcome to Monday's Granada Reports. We are live for the latest across the Northwest. Hello, thank you for your company. Here's what's coming up on the programme. Held captive by the Taliban for nine months, now back home and safe in Lancashire. Kevin Cornwall tells us his relief at being reunited with his wife and number one supporter. I just went over to her, grabbed her, over, hugged her, and I just found it very difficult to speak for about maybe one or two minutes. You know, I just didn't have the words. The Berry Market traders scared a Christmas shutdown might cost them their business. Fully stocked. I've got everything. Everything's been ready for over a week now, and this is all I can do. I can just look at my unit through a window because I've been told I can't trade. Linda Nolan on stepping away from the stage and not living in fear after learning her cancer has spread. There are sad days, obviously, but most days I try, if yeah. I'm going down that road, I go, no, we're going to do this, get a gin, where's yeah. the gin? <laughs> and in the weather, some beautifully wintry scenes from around the region over the weekend. However, this week, things turning less cold. All the details coming up. So please do stay with us, but first tonight, a boy accused of killing teenager Brianna Jai told police he saw his co-accused stabbing her. Jurors were shown the suspect's police interviews today in the second week of the trial. Boy Y and girl X, who can't be named because of their age, are accused of stabbing Brianna to death in Culture Linear Park near Warrington in February. Our correspondent Rob Smith has been following the case for us at a Manchester Crown Court. And Rob, you heard the initial interviews with detectives in which Boy Y blamed girl X for Brianna's murder. Yeah, Y said that he did not inflict any injuries on Brianna Jai and he was metres away and not even looking at her when she was stabbed to death in that park near Warrington back in February. He told that to police in a statement two days after the killing, two days after Brianna was seen leaving home for the very last time, captured on a doorbell camera video already shown to the court. Jurors told she was heading out to meet the two defendants. Boy Y said that yes, he had been in the park with Brianna and the other defendant known as Girl X. And then he told officers, quote, I turned away to go to the toilet on a tree. And when I turned back, I saw Girl X stabbing Brianna. When she stopped, I went over to check if Brianna was alive. I got blood on my hands. Girl X started to run. He added that he panicked at that point. He followed Girl X out of the park and between them they tried to make up a cover story. Girl X, for her part in her police interview also played on the big screens in this courtroom said that yes they had been in the park, they'd been walking, they'd been chatting but Brianna had ditched them. She had gone off. She'd been looking at her phone and she'd said that she was going to meet someone, a boy, 17 years old from Manchester. He was picking her up in his car. Girl X told officers she was worried about that because she thought it was someone Brianna had met online. But Brianna told her not to interrogate her. She got angry. She walked off. Girl X saying to police that the first she knew about the killing was when it appeared on the news. The trial has already been told that Girl X and Boy Y had what's been described as a preoccupation with torture, with killing. They're said to have had a list of people they wanted dead. They're said to have planned Brianna's murder in advance. Both the teenagers who cannot be identified for legal reasons deny murder. Each says that they did not kill Brianna. Each blames the other for what happened. OK, Roberts, Manchester Crown Court. Thank you. Well, next tonight, an aid worker from Lancashire held hostage in Afghanistan says he's now focused on making memories with his family who he thought he might never see again. Yes, Kevin Cornwall from Fleetwood was helping to set up a clinic for Afghans in January when he was arrested by the Taliban. The charges were dropped, but he was held for nine months and he became seriously ill. Well, he's now back home with his wife, Kelly, who fought hard for his release. They've been chatting to our reporter, Katie Cole. We were taxiing down the runway. I still wasn't convinced I was leaving at this point. Um, not until that plane was in the air and it was out of the airspace. When I arrived in front of Kelly, um, then I knew that that was it. I knew I was safe. Back home with his wife, Kevin Cornwell tells me how this nightmare ended and started. That moment 11 months ago, 
when he returned to his Afghanistan hotel and was met by the Taliban. My room was totally in disarray. There was everything turned upside down. All my equipment um, was spread across the room. My clothing was spread across the room um, in my bedroom area and in my office environment as if someone had threw something in there and it exploded. I said, uh, you have uh, weapons? I said, yes, I've got, I've got a weapon. And I said, I have a weapon which is in my safe. I went to show him where the safe was, but um, the wardrobe door was open and my safe had been broken open, um, potentially with a crowbar or something like that. There was no pistol in there. We got put into a Land Cruiser. Um, we got bags put over our heads. Um, I had my phones taken off me and turned off straight away. And as soon as I saw them go in a clear plastic bag, which was like a Ziploc bag, I thought, I think I might be here a while. Kevin was under the control of the Taliban. They had regained control of Afghanistan 18 months earlier when Western coalition forces left. Kevin says his gun was licensed and he had it in case of a terrorist attack. The charges were later dropped, but he did not go home. He was only allowed outside of his cell for 20 minutes a month. Inside he meditated and practised taekwondo, although that nearly cost him his life because the guard kept coming to the cell door and making threats to me because they could see on the CCTV that I was doing something, you know, related to like combat and fighting and things like that. So I just stopped doing that because I was sick of the threats coming to the, the door or the cage with an AK-47 or a pistol or a knife and just telling me that I was going to die and they were going to kill me. Kevin's life was also in danger because of an ongoing kidney condition. Twice he developed sepsis. His wife Kelly began to share their story. She called for his release and said she was considering going to Afghanistan. I have come to terms with the possibilities of what could happen mm. um, and if it's just one last time to see him. It's not something that I would have chose to have done in any other circumstances, but Kevin was important to me and it was something that I needed to do. It was only after I'd taken it to the press two days after I got a phone call straight from Kevin. I don't really think we talked about much, did we? It was just- No, I don't think so. No, seven minutes of I love you. <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, and yeah. quite a lot of tears. Yeah. Did you think the worst could happen? That I could die. Yeah, 10,000 people in the UK die every year of sepsis. It's a, one of the biggest infections that anybody can have. But the thing is that I wasn't, uh, I wasn't in a sort of normal frame of mind because the sepsis on both occasions made me hallucinate. Kelly was never so given permission to go and exactly see him, what, but she continued um, to bang on the door of the government for help. Eventually, 272 days after Kevin was detained, he came home. Surreal. It really was surreal. I just went over to her, grabbed all the hugged her, and I just found it very difficult to speak for about maybe one or two minutes. You know, I just didn't have the words. I wasn't able to say a thing, um, and it was quite emotional. Well. Now to rebuild their lives. Next week, Kevin will have an operation on his kidney. He's taking it a day at a time and enjoying the simplest of things. Building memories with the family is the most important thing. Build the memories, not videoing it, not photographing it. Building them inside your head with the people that are most important to you. You know, sometimes I just feel like, because he's home now, I just feel like God's favorite child. I've had my miracle. It's difficult to imagine the journey Kevin and his family have been on. Thankfully, now they can look forward. Katie Cole, ITV News. Yeah, what a terrifying ordeal and just um, great to see Kevin is back where he belongs with his wife. Um, OK, more of the day's news now. And the cleanup is ongoing after major disruption from snow in the south of Cumbria over the weekend. Drivers were left stranded overnight on Saturday and now 36 hours later, people are still being warned to travel with care as some rural routes are yet to be treated. Disabled people from across the northwest have gathered in Manchester to talk about how disability access and rights have changed over the years and how much work still needs to be done. The event at Central Library is part of Disability History Month. Luke Beasley from Disabled People's Archive says it's important to remember how the city of Manchester has been shaped by disabled people. The history of disability activism in Manchester is a key part of Manchester's history. Um, when you look at the way that the, the city is laid out, 
when you look at the kind of concerns that we have about transport, about personal support and assistance, um, about the way in which we run every single element of, of our city. That has been shaped by the actions that disabled people have taken and the fights that we've made for um, equality, freedom and the right to take part in and, and change society. And a major landmark of the Northwest skyline is no more. The cooling towers at Fiddler's Ferry Power Station near Widnes were demolished yesterday. It opened in 1971 and was in operation for nearly 50 years before closing three years ago. Well, next to the market traders in Berry who say they're facing an uncertain Christmas period. They're still in limbo after the indoor market building was closed down in October because of fears of a rack or aerated concrete. Yes, the closure affected almost 50 stallholders and a third of them are still waiting for alternative units. They've uh, told us they're worried that if they can't trade over the festive season, they might have to shut up for good. Our reporter Victoria Grimes went to chat to some of them. Berry Market's been thriving for nearly 600 years. It was even voted Britain's favourite in 2022. But for the last six weeks, some traders from the indoor market have been left out in the cold, unable to trade there following safety concerns about the building. Hopes of a Christmas booster business are fading fast. Karen Simpson's currently selling homeware from a pop-up nearby. It's tiny compared to the five stalls she runs at the indoor market. It's a big outlet in there that um, just doesn't fit anywhere easily. So it, it's been a big headache. It's been incredibly scary. Um, and you just don't know what the future holds. So you just got to take a day at a time. Well, I've been relocated from the uh, Berry Market Hall, just further up the road over here, to, to this unit. Uh, it's, it's fully stocked, I've got everything, everything's been ready for over a week now and this is all I can do, I can just look at my unit through a window because I've been told I can't trade. For card shop owner Mikesh, it's a race against time to recoup his festive season outlay. It's time sensitive, all of this stuff. I've spent tens of thousands of pounds on it, uh, some of it's still not even paid for so it's, in, it's on credit. It's time sensitive, nobody wants Christmas cards in January. So I'm, I'm, this is all I can do, just watch myself just lose money every single day. Well, this part of Berry Market's been here since the 1970s and it's parts of the indoor market behind me which have been closed since the discovery of that rack concrete material in the building which forced the closure. Now at the moment, nobody quite knows when the jewel in Berry's crown is due to open again. Beautician Chelsea and hairdresser Sam have even agreed to share a temporary premises to help them get trading again. All they want for Christmas is the keys to the door and a bit of festive goodwill from the council. We was given £300, um, a hardship fund, about six weeks ago. All the bills are racking up, um, yeah, and we got £300 six weeks ago. Just please help us, give us some support. We We've dedicated years into the market. I've worked on there since I was 13. We've invested money and time, and we just want them to invest in us a little bit and help us at this time as well, especially with it being Christmas around the corner. Berry Council say they're doing all they can to get traders up and running in new premises and say that two-thirds of those affected are already back in business. In a statement, they said for the remaining traders, we're in the process of agreeing alternative locations in council-owned properties and in Millgate Shopping Centre. We're working with the Millgate to transfer the leases and ensure the necessary repairs and safety checks, such as electric, asbestos and legionella, have been carried out. We've been in regular contact they say with the traders to keep them updated and are meeting with them tomorrow to discuss timescales. We will also be discussing further financial measures to support them at this difficult time. But as Christmas draws closer, those traders are hoping it won't be too little too late. Victoria Grimes, ITV News, Barry. Yeah, really worrying time for those traders. Hope they can start trading again soon. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Well, there's still plenty more to come on the programme coming up. Good days and bad days. The singer Linda Nolan tells us she's refusing to live in fear after the news her cancer has spread.
And in the weather, all looking very seasonal and wintry at the moment with temperatures below average. But as the week wears on, we'll be trending more to around average, where we should be for the time of year. So things turning less cold. It will get rather wet and windy, though. All the details coming up. And the ITV Evening News follows us at 6.30. Here's Mary Nightingale with all the details. Coming up in the programme, homes without power, schools closed and hundreds of cars marooned, the lives being disrupted by severe weather. Heavy snow has led to a major incident being declared in Cumbria with warnings for heavy rain and potential flooding elsewhere. The government's new plan to lower record numbers of legal migration to the UK. And homeward bound after 12 years, Edinburgh's giant pandas head for China. Well, do join me for those stories and more at 6.30. Well, Wigan Athletic will host Manchester United in the third round of the FA Cup. It's one of a number of eye-catching ties. Latics securing their place in round three, courtesy of their 1-0 win against York. Bolton Wanderers are heading for Premier League Luton Town, thanks to their impressive 5-1 win against Harrogate. Morecambe have been drawn away to championship side Swansea. That's after their 2-0 victory at Wickham Wanderers. Stockport County can look forward to a trip to West Brom if they win their replay against Aldershot. The two sides drew 2-2 yesterday. Well, here is that third round draw, draw featuring all our remaining clubs. Arsenal v Liverpool leaps out, as does Tottenham against Burnley. And down there at the bottom, Preston North End heading to Chelsea. Those ties at the start of January. Getting that winning feeling. FOW. Sponsors of the Granada Sport Report. next to an exciting week for netball fans as many of England's big names return to international duty for the first time since the summer's World Cup. England are taking on South Africa in a three-match series being played throughout this week with the first game at Manchester's AO Arena tomorrow. Chris Hall went along to today's training session. For Blackpool's Ellie Cardwell, 2023 has been picture perfect. The star of Adelaide's first ever Super Netball victory made ticker tape angels in Australia before flying to South Africa, helping England reach their first ever World Cup final. We were all about making memories, having fun in the moments, but then when it comes down to getting the job done, we're getting the job done and getting that silver medal around our neck. So, yeah. <laughs> That's I can see you're still sort of pinching yourself yeah, a little bit when you think about it. But how much confidence does that give to this team now? Obviously, we won like the Com Games gold medal a few years ago, but that was a completely different group. So knowing that we can do it with this group of girls, it does instill like, a lot of confidence in us that we can do it and we can really push number one, number two in the world. The boards are back in town for England's return to Manchester's AO Arena, where 8,000 fans will have local heroes to cheer, like Berry Neal from Prestwich and Macclesfield's Amy Carter, who's back in the red dress after a long-term injury, which gave her time to complete her medical degree. Oh, it means a lot, especially with these girls coming to Manchester. I really want them to like Manchester. I'm like, oh, this is this. And I'm like a bit of a tour guide and showing, showing around. Like we're in Fallowfield at the moment, which was where I was at uni. But now Curry Miles, like this is Curry Mile. I'm like, this is the skyscrapers that's just been built. <laughs> now that you are a doctor, do you find that everybody's coming to you with their ailments in camp and coming up to you, can you just have a look at this? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and some of it I don't want to have a look at. <laughs> I've been a Manchester Thunder fan since I can remember. And I remember going to the games when I was like 10 or 11 with like the like thumb-like things and they always had the drums on and I just love the environment. And it's so nice to quite a few years down the line be back in Manchester and representing England. They're already looking towards the next World Cup in 2027, so this team is heading into a transitional spell with exciting young talent rubbing shoulders with silver medalists. But team bonding here isn't a problem. We've got some young ones that bring a lot of energy, like Barry and Jade are doing dance routines and singing, and that brings a bit of energy. Yeah, me and Jade have been trying to bring some fun, so we've been doing carol singing. We went round everyone's room carol, carol singing the other night. And Go on, give us a burst of a Christmas carol. Oh, no, I can't, I can't, I can't. <laughs> Shortly after last Christmas, England were held to a draw by tomorrow's opponents, South Africa. 
But after the World Cup and then a surprise win over New Zealand, these roses are just beginning to bloom. Chris Hall, ITV News, Manchester. Finally, from netball to basketball and an incredible fight back by the Cheshire Phoenix. They were 13 points down in the fourth quarter against the Leicester Riders, only to run out 87 points to 83 winners and keep the pressure on British basketball league leaders, the London Lions. And that, guys, is your sport this evening. Lovely stuff. Thanks, Mike. Mm -hmm. Well, next, to uh, one of the uh, Northwest's most loved musical families, the Nolans. They were one of the world's biggest girl bands when they were formed in Blackpool almost 50 years ago. But of the six sisters, four have been diagnosed with cancer. Yeah, lead singer Bernie died in 2013, and now, 10 years on, Linda has been forced to stop doing what she loves the most, performing on stage, because her cancer has now spread. Our entertainment correspondent, Caroline Whitmore, sat down with her to reflect on her musical highs and her family's lows. Linda Nolan, I need to start by saying you look absolutely incredible. Thank you. Thank God for makeup. <laughs> You've been so open about your journey. Yeah. Where are you with it then now? The last results were promising, but the results before that were when it spread to my brain. And that was a real, real kick to the stomach. It happened to Bernie, you know. When it got to Bernie, to her brain, she was a little bit further on than I, I am now. I just try to try to wake up and go, ah, oh, another day to make memories. There are sad days, obviously, but most days I try, if, yeah. if I'm going down that road, I go, no, we're gonna do this, get the gin, where's yeah. the gin? I remember reading about a new drug that they were trying, they're calling it a wonder drug, is that something you've been able to take? The immunotherapy that I'm on at the moment has helped, it, that helped as well to shrink the tumours. So we're going to go with that for yeah, a while. Yeah, brilliant. Um, and your hair looks like it's growing oh back. Oh God, I know. Yeah. A, bit, a bit Ken Dodd though. I've got curls, I've never had <laughs> curls. Some women have, have written to me and said, I got my head shaved because I know how distraught you were when you got it shaved. And of course, when we're at bingo on a Sunday night, they come over while we're playing bingo. You're inspirational. I'm going, really? Three and nine, 39. <laughs> <laughs> Don't interrupt you while you're playing bingo then. They feel they know us because yeah. we've been around for so long. I was distraught losing my hair, really. And then when I looked in the mirror, I could see Bernie. People used to think we were twins. Even now though, somebody, sometimes they come up and say, oh, Bernie, you look great. And I think, I, I, part of me thinks don't correct them because they'll be mortified yeah. and the other part of me wants to say I look better than Bernie at the moment <laughs> thank you and that would be the cruel side <laughs> people ask us three of us have, have had breast cancer you know have we got the BRCA gene and all of that well we don't we've had the test in Manchester it will be a rogue gene somewhere because it's not just bad luck that three yeah. sisters got breast cancer. What a photograph to have in your sideboard <laughs> that old thing Frank Sinatra only Frankie yeah, we toured with him in 1975. I was 15, Bernie was 13. Colin didn't want to come with us because she wanted to stay at the stables with her horses. I bet she, she said it's the biggest regret of her life. Your career has been outstanding. Tell me it's not true. What has been the highlight for you? Blood Brothers. Bernie, myself, Denise and Maureen, we all played Mrs Johnston in Blood Brothers. And so the Guinness Book of Record is four siblings playing the same leading lady role in a West End musical. Wow. I know, who do we think we are? You were brought up in a house on Waterloo Road. Yes, we lived in a four bedroom terraced house. Eight kids and mum and dad. I don't know how we did it. <laughs> I'm in the mood for dancing. Back in 1979, do you ever get sick of it, Linda? I really don't because I think back to the time when it was, you know, recording properly at Abbey Road Studios we, we recorded. Do you miss performing now? To go back out and do Mrs Johnston, which I, I would have loved to have done at a point, is impossible. I love show business. For me, it's, it, it's given me wonderful memories. Having a big family. Does that help? I moved in with, with Denise and Tom, her partner. Everybody's there for me. My, I've got great friends as well. I've found a great support from the Macmillan people, one in particular, Julie, and she's been a massive support. And because of my brain cancer, I'm a little bit deaf. And Denise's partner, Tom, is, very, is a little bit deaf. And Denise 
this mad woman in the middle of us going, I've just told you! What did you say? <laughs> Sitting opposite you, you look incredible. I know some days you might not feel it. Thanks, Jazz, for the makeup. <laughs> <laughs> Lovely hearing your stories. I could sit here all day listening Thank to you. you. Well, it's always a joy to talk to you. Oh, she's in great spirits, isn't she? Oh, it is so mm -hmm. lovely to see her looking so yeah. well. What an inspirational family. Yep, yep. Thank you so much for sharing that with us, Linda. Mm. Right, now let's see how the weather is shaping up. Here's Emma with the details. Why do I need a shower? I've been out in the rain. The faster you go, the sooner you'll be out. You'll save water too. United okay. Utilities sponsors ITV Granada Weather. Hello there, I hope you had a good day today in spite of the weather which was grey and wet and miserable and windy across the Isle of Man as well. Of course over the weekend those snowfalls in Cumbria caused chaos for many but as we move through this week it is going to be turning less cold and so more likely that we'll have showers of rain rather than anything else after Thursday but it will be an unsettled week, certainly quite wet and windy later on in the week. So rewinding to the detail, low pressure was in charge today, flinging showers and rain in from the east. We have been quite protected by the pen Tomorrow, a temporary ridge of high pressure builds in, killing off any showers, so brighter Tuesday afternoon. But that does, of course, mean a clear cold night. It's going to get bitterly cold Tuesday night into Wednesday, minus two, minus four Celsius again. But then this low pressure system pushes in on Wednesday, introducing milder southwesterlies, and we'll really feel those from Thursday onwards. So rewinding to the next few hours, still the showers continue, the cloud is very dense overhead. I don't think we'll have any ice issues overnight tonight because temperatures will be quite a bit up on last night. We were minus, minus one, minus two Celsius last night, so tonight three, four Celsius. There will be the showers continuing, could be a touch of transient sleet over the very, very tops of the Pennines, and there will be some showers around first thing on Tuesday. Talking of which, the sun is up at 8.10, sets at 3.52 on Tuesday. It's certainly going to be a better afternoon than morning, and as the high pressure builds in, we see some brighter skies. Still a bit cloudy through parts of Cheshire, Greater Manchester as well into the afternoon, but brighter through parts of Lancashire and Cumbria, with lighter winds than today. Very cold overnight into Wednesday. Wednesday, though, with only a few showers on Wednesday. United Utilities sponsors ITV Granada Weather. Thanks, Emma. That's it for Granada Reports for now. On tomorrow's programme, though, we'll be chatting to singer Rebecca Ferguson, who's back in the Northwest to tell us all about her new album. I'm a big, big fan of Rebecca, so I'm certainly looking forward to that. Um, I'm back with another update at the latest time of 5 to 11. But for now, I do hope you enjoyed what is left of your evening. Bye-bye. See you later. <laughs>